On a beautiful sunny day in March of 1979, as thousands of Egyptians awaited in anticipation, a plane landed in Cairo. Moments later, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat stepped out, welcomed by thunderous cheers from an overjoyed crowd. He had just returned to his country from Washington, D.C., where five days earlier he had signed a historic treaty with Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and United States President Jimmy Carter, bringing an end to three decades of war and hostilities between Israelis and Egyptians. Since 1948, Egypt had joined other Arab states and went to war with Israel on four occasions. All of them were ultimately unsuccessful in fully defeating Israel and Egypt of all the Arab states experienced the heaviest losses both in human casualties and financially. As with many historic moments that inspired significant change, not everyone was supportive of Sadat's peace efforts. Only two years after the signing of the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, President Anwar Sadat was assassinated by members of an Islamic fundamentalist group in October of 1981. This episode of African Biographics is part two of a three-part series on the history of Egypt told through the lives of three of its former leaders, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Anwar Sadat, and Hosni Mubarak. Born into a family of 13 children on 25 December 1918, Anwar Sadat grew up among average Egyptian villagers in the town of Mit Abu Kom, 40 miles to the north of Cairo. By the time of his birth, Egypt had become a British colony. His grandmother instilled in Sadat a great love for Egyptian history by telling stories of Arab power and pride before the British came to occupy the country. From an early age, Sadat was an avid reader. Among the books and newspapers he devoured were accounts of Mahatma Gandhi's struggle against the British in India, a struggle Sadat admired and later sought to emulate. Anwar Sadat's political ascendance began with his matriculation in the military academy. As a result of the 1936 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty, access to the military academy was no longer restricted to the upper class. For the first time, the National Military Academy was opened to boys of the working class. The effect was to bring together in the military the very groups that were most politically active in Egypt and most eager for a change in the status quo. These sons of clerks, low-ranking officers, and small businessmen brought into the officer corps the anti-colonial fervor then prevalent on the streets of Cairo. At the military academy, Anwar Sadat met Gamal Abdel Nasser, beginning a long political association that eventually led to the Egyptian presidency. In the years after he entered the academy, Sadat was active in many political movements including the Muslim Brotherhood, the Fascist Young Egypt, and a secret military group called the Free Officers which sought to liberate Egypt from British influence. In the early 1940s, during the Second World War, the Nazis led by Adolf Hitler and their ally Italy began invading Libya, forcing Britain to send Egyptian troops to defend the western border of British territory. However, some Egyptian soldiers, including Sadat, wanted to side with the Nazis in exchange for help in removing British control from Egypt. And so in 1941, Sadat and other officers started to plan a revolution with the assistance of the Nazis. When the British discovered Sadat's plans, he was stripped of his military rank and was arrested. While languishing in jail, Sadat learned English by reading newspapers and books, and he also learned German from another inmate. After two years in jail, Sadat tried to escape. His first attempt failed, but his second, in 1944, was successful. Hiding from the authorities, he lived as a fugitive, using the name Haji Muhammad, growing a beard to disguise his face and working as a garage mechanic. Anwar Sadat soon resumed his plans to overthrow the British control of Egypt. He planned one assassination attempt on Egypt's prime minister at the time, but the effort was unsuccessful. Another assassination attempt, this one successful, resulted in the death of Egyptian political leader Amin Osman Pasha, who supported a union between Egypt and Britain. For his part in the assassination of Pasha, Sadat was again sent to jail in January of 1946. Anwar Sadat endured two years in prison before his trial, in which he was found not guilty. Upon his release, Anwar Sadat resumed his political activities and in 1950, Gamal Abdel Nasser asked Sadat to join the Free Officers Movement. This revolutionary movement had grown considerably while Sadat was in prison. 
On 23 July 1952, the Free Officers' Movement staged a coup d'etat overthrowing the Egyptian monarchy. Anwar Sadat was chosen to announce the coup leader's initial proclamations on the radio. As a group, the Free Officers were largely unknown to the Egyptian public for months after the coup and Sadat was in no way visible among them at first, but as time passed, he took on a public role as a fiery propaganda chief for the revolution. He was named editor of Al Gumuria, the daily paper established as a regime mouthpiece in 1953. Sadat became an outspoken opponent of Western imperialism. With Gamal Abdel Nasser soon strengthening his hand and pushing out the opposition, Sadat loyally supported the powerful leader. As factional politics swirled within the leadership of the Free Officers, from the purge of General Mohammed Naguib in 1954 to the dismissal of the military leadership after the disastrous Six-Day War of 1967, Anwar Sadat appeared detached from the action. Insulting caricatures of him appeared in the press and jokes circulated about the lack of esteem Sadat enjoyed among his colleagues. Although he was named Speaker of the National Assembly in 1959 and Vice President in 1969, very few people took him as a serious contender for power, but I'll touch on this later. Meanwhile, while working with Gamal Abdel Nasser, Sadat learned the dangerous game of politics in a world of superpower rivalries. Their most important trial came over the Suez Canal, which President Nasser nationalized in 1956. In a coordinated effort, the British, French, and the new nation of Israel launched an attack on Egypt, hoping to re-establish control over the canal. The war ended only after the United States pressured its allies to withdraw. Egypt emerged from the war a hero of the non-aligned countries, having successfully resisted colonial powers and maintained its control of the Suez Canal. However, Gamal Abdel Nasser's prominence in the Arab world suffered greatly from the debacle of the Six-Day War of June 1967. In this war, the Israeli military completely destroyed the Egyptian air forces and swept through the Sinai Peninsula to the Suez Canal, obliterating the Egyptian army. The war resulted in the Israeli occupation of what remained of the historic Palestine as well as the Egyptian Sinai Desert and the Golan Heights from Syria. In a matter of six days, the Israeli army delivered a huge setback to the forces of three Arab countries and occupied territory that was three and a half times its size. A peace agreement was finally reached between Israel and the Arab nations, but Israel refused to give back any of the land taken over during the war, including Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. The Six-Day War ruined the confidence of the Egyptian government and military, and Anwar Sadat himself remained locked up in his home for days after the ceasefire. The devastation from the war also threatened to bankrupt the Egyptian government. Internal squabbling among Arab nations and the growing Palestinian movement eventually strained Gamal Abdel Nasser's abilities to the limit. In 1969, Gamal Abdel Nasser, whose health was quickly failing, appointed Anwar Sadat as vice president of Egypt. President Nasser died nine months later from a heart attack and Anwar Sadat was elected president on 15 October 1970. When he succeeded Nasser, Anwar Sadat was completely unknown and untested. Both Egyptians and international diplomats wondered what type of leader Sadat would make. It has been widely reported that the United States CIA estimated that Sadat would last no longer than six months in office before a stronger leader emerged. Well, Sadat began to define his presidency within days of taking office by making changes to policies that NASA had set up. For instance, Sadat stopped the routine wiretapping of officials and also allowed news media to publish and broadcast without fear of censorship. Anwar Sadat surprised everyone with a series of intelligent political moves by which he was able to retain the presidency and emerge as a leader in his own right. He launched what he called the Corrective Revolution on 15 May 1971, through which he embarked on purging the government and security forces of all Nasserites, especially those who were pro-Soviet. Sadat first removed Ali Sabri, the chief of the air defense system, who was known to have close ties to the Soviet Union. Next, another top official, Sharawi Goma, was dismissed, triggering a mass resignation of top-level government officials who were loyal to both Sabri and Goma. 
Unexpected to those people who resigned, Anwasa Dad swiftly accepted their resignations, made the news public, and placed the entire group under house arrest. That very night, Anwasa Dad formed a new government, filling the now empty positions with those he deemed were loyal to Egypt first rather than the Soviet Union nor their own self interests. The move against these once powerful figures won him cheers from the populace. Sadat's popularity soared even further when he cut back the powers of the much-hated secret police and set about dismantling the police state created by Gamal Abdel Nasser and his pro-Soviet advisors. Moreover, he gave the Islamists autonomy in return for political support. Sadat appropriated the title of Believer President, arranged for the mass media to cover his praying at mosques and began and ended his speeches with verses from the Quran. Anwar Sadat also encouraged the growth of Islamic student associations, promoted Islamic courses in schools, and reached an understanding with the Muslim Brotherhood, allowing it to function publicly once more as long as it foresaw violence. President Sadat also reversed foreign policies that isolated Egypt from all but the Soviet Union, and he also returned property and industry to private owners. Unfortunately, domestic and international crises presented Anwar Sadat with seemingly insurmountable problems. The Egyptian economy continued to reel from war with Israel, and the Egyptians' continuing relationship with the Soviet Union deteriorated as the Soviets proved to be unreliable allies. When pressed for more military support to replace the devastation of the Six-Day War, the Soviets simply ignored Anwar Sadat's requests. In a bold move, which soon became his trademark, Anwar Sadat expelled the Soviets. The move to expel the Soviets was so unexpected that it surprised even the United States, as Sadat had asked for nothing from the United States in exchange for expelling the Soviet advisors. Sadat's overall objective was to reduce Egypt's dependency on a single foreign power. This grand gesture to expel the Soviets solidified Egyptian internal support at a time when the average Egyptian was suffering greatly. The biggest trial facing Anwar Sadat was dealing with the aftermath of the Six-Day War with Israel. Upon taking power, he began peace talks with Egypt's long-time foe, Israel, almost immediately. Initially, Israel refused Sadat's terms, which proposed that peace could come if Israel returned to the Sinai Peninsula. Behind the scenes, however, Sadat was plotting to retake the Egyptian Sinai if the Israelis continued to refuse the Egyptian peace initiative. Anwar Sadat and Syria's Hafez al-Assad built a military coalition to retake their territory in 1973. On October 6, 1973, the day of Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, Anwar Sadat struck. Just after 2 p.m., the Egyptian and Syrian armies with advanced Soviet weapons launched a two-front offensive on Israel from the north and the south. President Sadat ordered his forces to cross the Suez Canal in a surprise attack that broke through Israeli defense lines in occupied Sinai. With Syrian forces invading Israel from the east through the Golan Heights, the coordinated attack drove the Israelis back with heavy casualties on both fronts. Indeed, the Israelis had been caught unaware. Israel lost more than one-third of its air force and many of its soldiers had died on the battlefield. Although they were now on the back foot, the Israelis managed to stage a counter-offensive. They also mobilized two armored divisions, which soon turned the Syrian advance into a retreat. The Israelis advanced, capturing territory deep inside Syria. As a result, units from the Iraqi, Saudi, and Jordanian armies joined the fight on the Syrian front to face the counter-attack. Still, the Israelis managed to achieve significant gains, advancing to within 35 kilometers of Damascus, Syria's capital, and occupying new territories to bring to the bargaining table. Both the Soviet Union and the Americans began airlifting arms, including tanks and artillery, to their allies as their stockpiles began to run out. On 16 October, 10 days after the start of the war, Israeli forces under the command of Ariel Sharon managed to penetrate Egyptian and Syrian defense lines and came within a shocking distance from Cairo, the Egyptian capital city. The counter-attack by the Israelis majorly turned the tide of the war in favor of the Israelis and the fighting came to a stalemate. On 17 October, the Arabs decided to use a different tactic, oil. 
The Arab oil producing countries under the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, decided to reduce their oil production by 5%. They pledged to maintain the same rate of reduction each month thereafter until the Israeli forces were fully withdrawn from all Arab territories occupied during the 1967 June war and the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people were restored. The Arab countries also enforced an embargo on the United States, suspending oil supply. The reduction in oil production and supply led to major oil price hikes around the world. Soon enough, no gas signs were seen at filling stations throughout the world. All of this caused the United States to reassess its support for the war. By the last week of October, the two sides were ready and willing to accept a ceasefire deal. The general feeling that prevailed in the Arab world, and especially in Egypt, was that of a great victory. Anwar Sadat's popularity was at an all-time high. Even though the Israelis had eventually regrouped and won back most of the lost ground, with this war, Sadat had shattered Israel's image of invincibility. In the process, the Egyptians restored their national honor by regaining some of their territory and by avoiding defeat. Anwar Sadat was held as the hero of the crossing, referring to his crossing of the Suez Canal to regain the Sinai. In the aftermath, President Sadat met with the United States Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and agreed to a ceasefire and withdrawal that would be supervised by the United Nations. But soon, arguments about the withdrawal broke out between Egypt and Israel. Henry Kissinger had to conduct separate talks with each side until Egypt and Israel signed a final ceasefire agreement in January of 1974. Still, despite the ceasefire and disengagement agreements, full peace was too far from being achieved. Though short-lived, the Yom Kippur War created a new momentum for peace both in Egypt and in Israel. These pressures coincided with continued domestic problems in Egypt. The deteriorating economy in Egypt, accompanied by a growing distance between the rich and the poor, led to internal strife, riots, strikes, and attacks on the rich. Because of the weakening economy and increasing domestic strife, Anwar Sadat was convinced that peace with Israel would reap rewards for Egypt. He used his political capital from the 1973 war to initiate peace talks with Israel. In a speech to the Egyptian parliament in 1977, President Sadat affirmed his desire to go anywhere to negotiate peace with the Israelis. He even affirmed that he would go to the Israeli parliament to speak for peace. In turn, the Israelis responded with an invitation to do just that, and Sadat's speech to the Israeli parliament initiated a new momentum for peace. When he finished his speech, he was met with thunderous applause, both from the Israeli parliament and from the Israeli population. President Sadat returned to Cairo and was welcomed by an electrified population and a parliament that was nearly in full agreement to endorse his actions. Beyond question or doubt, Sadat's visit to Jerusalem was one of the greatest milestones of the 20th century, becoming a cornerstone in the modern history of the Middle East. But in the months that followed, negotiations with Israel, again facilitated by the United States, stalled again over the Palestinian issue and territorial disputes. But a breakthrough soon came. In September of 1978, with the hope to finally settle a peace treaty once and for all, United States President Jimmy Carter invited Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin to Camp David in the United States. For 11 days, the three leaders negotiated, discussed, and argued. Finally, on September 17, 1978, the two sides, Israel and Egypt, were able to agree on a framework for peace. In short, this framework stipulated that Israel would execute a full withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula over a three-year period, while Egypt would develop full peaceful relations with Israel. The fact that there would be transitional agreements established for the West Bank and Gaza and for continued discussion over the status of Palestinians and Jewish settlers in the occupied territories was also included. Egypt would also allow free passage for Israeli ships through the Suez Canal. This framework was an essential step in the peace process and it ultimately led to the March 1979 signing of the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty. The treaty ended the state of war that had existed between the two nations since 1948. 
Together with Menashe Begin, Anwar Sadat was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1978. Peace with Israel was not without its costs. Sadat could not convince the Arab world that the Camp David Accords dealt justly with legitimate Palestinian rights. This led to the loss of financial support from the Arab states, which in turn resulted in economic hardships in Egypt. While Sadat's popularity rose in the West, it fell in Egypt because of internal opposition to the treaty and deteriorating economic conditions. Sadat's new relationship with the West and his peace treaty generated considerable domestic opposition, especially among fundamentalist Muslim groups. To them, the peace accord with Israel was commonly regarded as an opportunist capitulation to Israel and the United States that left the occupied Palestine territories of the West Bank and Gaza in the lurch. For some of the Egyptian Islamic fundamentalists, the peace deal with Israel was evidence presented on the world stage that Anwar Sadat needed to be removed from office at any cost. At the same time, President Sadat reacted to growing opposition to his regime by resorting to authoritarian rule and outright repression. In his most draconian move in September of 1981, President Sadat ordered the arrest of more than 1,500 people from across the political spectrum. Islamic activists, lawyers, doctors, journalists, university professors, and political opponents. A few weeks later, on 6 October 1981, it was a sunny day when President Anwar Sadat, dressed in army uniform, witnessed a military parade to commemorate the success of his October 1973 battle. During the celebration, Anwar Sadat looked up at the sky where the Egyptian Air Force Mirage jets were flying while army soldiers and troop trucks paraded by. Suddenly, a military truck containing a kill squad stopped in front of the tribune. An army officer, Khaled Al Islambuli, an officer in the Egyptian army, was the first to exit the vehicle. He began shouting and gesticulating angrily at President Sadat. In response to the commotion, Anwar Sadat stood up and shouted back to confront the young soldier. At this point, our Islam bully threw explosives at the stage where Anwar Sadat and his aides were sitting before returning to the vehicle to grab his weapon and shoot directly at the president. His colleagues who had stayed in the truck followed suit and began shooting. These weapons that they had brought to the parade were supposed to be just for show. Sure. But the assassins managed to smuggle in bullets for their AK-47 assault rifles. President Anwar Sadat was killed during this process. He was 63 years old. President Sadat was succeeded by his vice president, Wosni Mubarak, who went on to rule Egypt for three decades and whose story I'll cover in part three of this series. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, Cheers. Have a good one.